Welcome to Marrow Masters Season 9, sponsored by the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society and Sanofi. The National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, established in 1992, strives to help patients, caregivers, and families cope with the psychosocial challenges of bone marrow and stem cell transplant, from diagnosis through survivorship. Season 9 of our show focuses on what I wish I knew before transplant. Here's your host, Executive Director of the NBMT Link, Peggy Burkhardt. Hello, everyone. Today, we welcome Leela Pruitt, who was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia, which is AML, in early February 2021. Hello, Leela. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is going to be great. So, Leela, we're going to talk about your transplant experience first, and then we're going to get into all the tips and tricks and ideas that you have to help people have a better transplant experience. Well, it's an ongoing process, to be sure. When I was diagnosed, as you said, in early February of 2021, I had no idea that there was no leukemia care in my community. I live in Port Angeles, Washington, which is a small, remote community in Washington State, about three hours from the nearest specialty care in Seattle. So what that ends up being for me is that I have a very dispersed medical team. So I have a primary care doctor in Port Angeles, I have an oncologist in Seattle, and I got my transplant at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, now known as Fred Hutch Cancer Center in Seattle. So there's lots of travel involved. I actually, with my wife, had to move to Seattle for seven months to have a stem cell transplant. We've done a lot of partnering with the Hutch through the years. Can you please tell me more about your experience there? My experience at Fred Hutch was absolutely wonderful. They began with uh, an evaluation just after I finished early chemotherapy at Swedish Hospital, also in Seattle. And from that point of the initial evaluation on through the stem cell transplant, on through the immediate post-transplant period, and now in long-term follow-up with them, I just can't have been more pleased. I have a team of providers there, doctors, nurses, other providers there that collaborate to come up with recommendations for me, and then they share those with my primary care provider and with my oncologist. So it really is a team approach and has been very effective in my case. I feel completely safe with them providing those recommendations for treatment and ongoing care. Let's talk about date, month that you had your actual transplant. I had my transplant on June 10th of 2021. It went fairly well. I felt well, um, almost immediately tired, but generally well. And um, that continued until about six months out from transplant when I came down with graft-versus-host disease in multiple organ systems and ended up having to begin a course of steroids and immune suppressant called tacrolimus. And those drugs resulted in some very significant side effects that I'm still dealing with. I'm so sorry to hear that. We hear it all too often. Graft-versus-host disease is a tricky thing. So how are you doing today? How are you dealing with it? And what other complications if I can ask, did you experience? Well, the treatment for graft-versus-host disease produced a hypothyroid condition that I'm being treated for, also diabetes related to steroid, to prednisone, peripheral neuropathy, so I have difficulty feeling my feet, although I'm fortunate I don't have a lot of pain in my feet from that, but difficulty sometimes keeping my balance. Some um, possible heart issues that we're just beginning to explore that may have been caused by the chemotherapy I had initially. Um, A drug called mitoxantrone has some cardiac toxic effects, and we're thinking we may be seeing some of that. So how this all manifests in my day-to-day life is a very profound fatigue and weakness. My muscles are very weak. This began right after I started being treated for graft-versus-host disease of the liver in March 2022, so about nine months post-transplant, and it's worsened considerably since it started. So when, after my transplant, I felt like I was just going to keep getting better and better because I was walking a couple of miles a day and getting back to some of my normal activities, that all went away with graft-versus-host disease, and that's what I'm dealing with now. 
Okay, so this is not easy. Are you still consistently feeling the effects of the graft versus host disease? And then is it getting any better? The graft versus host disease is actually improving. The liver improved almost immediately with prednisone, which I understand that that doesn't always happen. So I'm very fortunate in that way. However, the side effects of prednisone are lasting much longer than I anticipated. So the graft-versus-host disease has improved pretty much across the board with the treatment. But now the issue is, can we back off of steroids? Can we back off of tacrolimus and maintain that improvement? Or are things going to kind of go south again and have a flare-up of the graft-versus-host disease in any one of those organ systems that are affected? Yes. Oh, boy. All right. So let's get to the heart of this conversation now. Now that we have the background, what do you wish you had known and better understood before your transplant? Uh, First and foremost, I wish I'd known that surviving the transplant itself is not the end point. It's just the beginning. I had felt like I was most concerned about whether I would actually survive the transplant. I was 64 at the time and was given a laundry list of risks and potential mortality. And so I was very concerned about just surviving the transplant. So there was really no discussion about what survivorship after the transplant meant and that it would have physical, emotional, and spiritual challenges that for me have been a lot more difficult to navigate than the actual transplant. There have been the late complications, the the graft-versus-host disease, Um, health problems associated with treating that, Um, concerns about my mortality and uncertainty about the future, coping with relationship changes, coping with dramatic changes in my body, how it looks, how it feels, and changes to my quality of life. So I wish that these facets of survivorship had really been discussed at some depth prior to my discharge, and that just did not happen. Well, I think it's hard, you know, like you said, they're in the moment trying to save your life Mm -hmm. and get you to survivorship. And that's why, you know, for a second, just to say we are here for everyone that is in that situation. We have so many programs and we want to help with the unmet needs. So, for example, this podcast today, you're giving everyone your honest, the nitty gritty on this. So let's talk further what your tips would be for those in early survivorship. Yeah, I think that for me, the biggest tip was to understand that survivorship is a distinct phase of transplant, that it involves a lot of emotional and physical changes that it's helpful to know about and not only know what some of the milestones and markers are of surviving transplant, but resources to get help if you need it. And I've actually found the MBMT link podcast to be really helpful in understanding the pathway after transplant, what's likely to happen, what a lot of people report as far as milestones, things like how you might feel emotionally after transplant, that you might feel abandoned at first, that you've had all of this intensive observation of your every move for months when you have a transplant and then suddenly They discharge you and you come back maybe every two weeks and that level of surveillance is just gone. That level of support is gone and that can produce feelings of abandonment and fear and anxiety. So things like that would be helpful to know is like to understand some of those markers and milestones and know where you can go to get help. Absolutely. And also let's talk again about the graft versus host disease. As far as my tips for graft versus host disease, I really do wish that I had known that graft versus host disease, I knew it was a possibility, but I didn't know that it was a long-term condition. I felt like it was a, well, if you get it, they're going to treat it and you're done with it. And that's just not necessarily true. It can take a very long time to quiet graft versus host disease with treatment. And from what I've been told most recently is that it can flare up and recede in cycles over months or years, most typically over at least a couple of years. So I wish that I'd really understood how toxic the treatments for GVHD can be 
with side effects like diabetes, changes in appearance, muscle wasting, tremors, etc., and that I understood that this could come and go over a period of years. So my tip for anyone who's dealing with a stem cell transplant or any sort of a bone marrow transplant is that you understand what GVHD looks like, what the chronic looks like, what the acute may look like, and that the course may be a series of flare-ups that require long-term treatment that can result in some very serious, potentially life-threatening side effects and immune suppression. So, and to understand what the impacts of high-dose steroids, the most typical early treatment for graft host disease, what the impact of those steroids is and other immune suppressant medications so that you're prepared that having a transplant isn't the end. If you get graft host disease, it's a whole other series of challenges. Absolutely. Oh, so let's talk about your medical team. What did you learn about that during your journey? So I had to kind of put together my own team, which was a little difficult at first, but it's now more established and I feel very comfortable with it. And I, I feel like my best tip on medical teams is to get yourself a primary care provider wherever you live, whether it's in a rural area like mine where they don't have a lot of experience with leukemia to a, a big city where you have someone that's much more well-versed in the kind of care you're getting, get yourself a primary care provider that is willing and able to communicate with the other providers on your team. And then you'll most likely have an oncologist. And in my case, I have a stem cell transplant center, the Fred Hutch Cancer Center, and I have several providers there. So it's still a challenge to keep them all talking and um, not be asked to go in to a visit with one of them and make a change without talking to the others. So you need to work to help your team communicate and be a team. And part of that is keeping good notes and records, making sure you're familiar with the records that are being generated on you. My chart has been a real lifesaver for me in keeping track of that. Also asking questions, to keep asking questions until you get an answer that you understand and is satisfactory to you. Who's your leader? I mean, who can you call? Who are you supposed to call if you get COVID, if you get an infection, if you have an emerging or worsening problem, who do you call on your team? So all of those things are really, really important to get straight. And unfortunately, well, maybe not unfortunately, for whatever good or bad, difficult or easy, you're going to be the person that kind of has to hold things together. And it's easy to abdicate that responsibility when you're feeling bad or you're feeling low, but you really need to keep at it and keep those people communicating. It's to your best advantage. You are so right. I mean, advocating for yourself, we tell people that all the time. You have to be your best advocate. How did it go for you managing costs? Uh, you know, I was faced with some medication costs that were going to break my budget completely. And I had very good insurance. Part of the issue for me was I switched to Medicare. Just after my transplant, I switched to Medicare. So that changed my insurance and it made it more difficult to pay for certain medications. So I found that if you approach the drug manufacturers for free or reduced cost medications, you can really get some good results. So there is a drug called Latermavir, also known as Provimus, that uh, helps to prevent graft versus host disease right after transplant. And it was about 2000 a month was going to be the copay. But when I applied, even though I thought my income was too large, to qualify for any reduced cost, I got it for free for several months. So I think it's really to your advantage, even though it may be uncomfortable, even though it's a lot of paperwork at times, to contact your social worker, or you can try to approach pharmaceutical companies yourself and ask for a reduced cost application. Excellent advice. I'm so glad you touched on that. That's so important. Okay, let's talk next about quality of life issues. Living a life changed forever and living in the now. I want to hear more about this. Well, you know, I it's a difficult thing to put into perspective sometimes. It's like, should I be waiting for health before I start living? Do I wait until I'm like I used to be before I start living? 
Or do I live now, even though I don't always feel well, even though my life is not anything approaching normal, seems like to me, I am realizing more and more that normal may not return no matter how much I want to get back to my old life. And I may not be able to find a new normal that's reliable and consistent. Things kind of keep changing. So living now to me is to wake up every day, assess what energy I have for the day, find at least one thing that's fun to do, and do my best to enjoy the moment and stay in the now. Oh, I love this so much. Thank you for sharing that. I think we could all take that advice. So, Layla, how do you pace yourself? How do you decide what to do? Well, in one way, I have to choose things. And I suggest to people who have not been affected by uh, leukemia to imagine to have to choose among all the things you do in a day, because you can very abruptly only do a little bit of them, only a fraction of them. And the thing that I came up with is that doing is less important somehow than being alive. Yet it's remarkable how much doing has become essential to many of our identities and self-worth. And so one of the things I do to make choices is to disentangle as much as I can the being versus the doing and try to focus on wholeness and happiness in being. And this, the second factor is that I really miss my old body. I knew my old body. It always came through when I pushed myself. I always responded well to exercise. I could easily build muscle and endurance. And I've learned that my pre-cancer habit of pushing myself to get stronger just doesn't work for now. When I push myself, I'm going to be on the couch for the next couple of days. So what I have learned to do is to use the spoon theory approach. This is a, a framework for assessing energy that was developed by Christine Miserandino, who is a blogger back, I think in 2003, she came up with this. But anyway, she has an autoimmune disease and she envisioned her daily energy as a set of spoons and that everything she decided to do was going to use up spoons, each spoon being a unit of energy. Okay. And so she would calculate how many spoons she had in the day and what she planned to do. And if she didn't have enough spoons for it, she was going to have to modify her to-do list for that day. So I have and assign spoon values to the things I need and want to do. And I try every day not to overspend my spoons or I'm likely to be on the couch the next day. And just having a framework for budgeting my energy and for talking to other people about how my energy is budgeted helps me to avoid exhaustion and to feel more engaged and capable of doing things. I love this spoons theory. We had talked about this uh, in another episode before with Meredith Cowden, and I just think it's brilliant. <laughs> I, I actually learned about it from that Meredith Cowden episode. Oh, you did. Oh, great. And started using it right after that. Yeah, I'm so grateful that she brought that up. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. And I think I might have even told the story before about a gentleman who told us he thinks of his body at the beginning of the day as a charged battery. And as the day goes on, the battery is going to get lower and lower. And then by dinner time, the battery is going to die. So you have to pick and choose how you are going to spend your battery life for the day. And I think that's also a great visual. It's perfect. I mean, it, <laughs> it's generally, I think, from what I've heard from others as well, that having a transplant, having a stem cell, having a bone marrow transplant, whether autologous or allogeneic, uh, it doesn't matter that fatigue is a common problem. And fatigue seems to work really well with the battery or the spoon theory approach because you can think about it running out by the end of the day. And you know, if you're anything like me, you know that if you overspend that energy, your fatigue is going to carry forward into the next day or so. Absolutely. So how do you enjoy life? What does it look like to have meaningful days around the restrictions, inconveniences, discomforts, and anxieties of treating and recovering from the treatments? And monitoring the disease. You know, it's um, 
I try to get creative about it. One example is I, I've really been grieving the loss of being able to take long walks with my wife. We live in a beautiful part of the state of Washington, right near the Olympic National Park. And we used to, before my illness, we used to walk for miles every day looking at the birds and the the Salish Sea and just enjoying being out of doors. So what I finally decided to do was to get a wheelchair, not so much to sit in all the time. I don't need a wheelchair for my daily activities right now, but to take it with us so that I could push it myself to get as far as I could walk. And then I could sit down and she could push me for a while and uh, repeat, repeat. And that way I can get much further and see the things that I've really been missing for the last year. So I think you kind of have to get creative and about discomforts and things like that. Some days are a little bit low. If I'm having a lot of discomfort, some days I get tired of it, but I keep trying to accept what is and just be glad that I'm alive. Try to live as deeply and joyfully as I'm able to every day. Just my favorite thing in the world right now is when I get up in the morning, I come down to my easy chair and Carol makes me a mocha. (laughs) Oh, nice. And I just have the most wonderful time watching the sun come up and drinking a warm mocha. And um, that, despite what happens the rest of the day, that always puts me into a frame of mind of joy. So that's generally what I do is to try to find meaning regardless of how I'm feeling, to live well even when I'm not well. And I've learned, too, that right now is usually okay. Um, When I start worrying about not now, next minute, next hour, that's when I get into trouble. So um, even if I'm having something painful occur in a few minutes, like a bone marrow biopsy, it's not happening every moment. It's not happening right now. So I try to take on just now and relax and tell myself that I've got the resources internally. I've got the strength to deal with whatever comes, but I want to enjoy what's possible now. And I plan, but I do my best to practice not worrying about what hasn't happened yet. So I would recommend to anybody relaxation techniques, whatever works for you, positive self-talk, exercise, yoga, find what works for you to help you focus on this moment and not what's maybe going to happen or is likely to happen later. You are amazing. I think we (laughs) all need to listen to this advice (laughs) in our everyday lives. Wow. I just want to sit with you with a mocha. So we're going to have to do that one of these days. (laughs) So let's talk about relationships. Uh, It sounds like you have just some wonderful people in your lives. Let's talk about how that changed. Well, when side effects or late complications of transplant occur or other issues of survivorship, there may be a disconnect between you and your spouse or your family. There certainly has been in mine. There's the possibility that family and friends assume that everything is wonderful once you're discharged, though you may be struggling physically and emotionally more than you were during your immediate post-transplant period. And with ongoing healing or significant late side effects, you may not be able to partner in the same way you did before transplant. You need to find a new way to journey together. For example, I can't hike right now. I can't ride my bicycle. I can't even take a long walk, except now I have my wheelchair, so I'm working at it. (laughs) These are activities that my wife and I deeply enjoyed together nearly every day. And our realization was that she has a healthy body and she needs to do these things and she needs to do them now without me. It's a loss and it's a huge grief that we both have to find new ways of living that support our individual needs and our abilities and also support us as a couple. And it's tough. Relationships really do change. And another thing is you may be in a different process entirely about your relationship to your leukemia versus 
your family and friends may want to move on. Mm -hmm. So I like to say that AML, you know, acute myeloid leukemia is the little red wagon that I'll be dragging around after me the rest of my life. Mm. And I need to think about that sometimes. I need to ponder what my life and what AML means for me now. And I need to navigate the land between health and illness, which is also kind of the land between living and dying. And in some ways, I feel like I'm preparing for my own death and trying to be comfortable with the idea that I may not survive while still living my best life. I mean, none of us ultimately survive our lives, but I would certainly like to go longer than the statistics um, make me fearful of. So I try to do my best to give myself space to process those thoughts and feelings about living and dying with a life-threatening disease. And I realize that this can be really difficult for the healthy people in our lives that want to put the cancer behind them and get on with living and back to normal. So your spouse, your partner, your family and friends, they may not want to talk about mortality, about death and dying, and you may need to. You may need to talk about this and think about it more. And uh, you may get some blank stares or some retreats. People that you love and care for may just not be able to face that. They may feel helpless when you need to grieve your losses. So I would encourage people to pay attention to different communication styles for one. For example, my wife is very buttoned up, typically not unemotional, but a person who reserves emotion for private moments and tends not to be outwardly emotional. Um, If I start to talk to her about my own mortality or about a book I've read about someone that's died of leukemia, and um, she just gets a very blank look and doesn't want to talk about it. So I need to find other ways of meeting my own need for discussing mortality. And the way I've found it is to read books by people that have later died of their cancers. And I just find it so, so comforting that these people have been dealing with the same issues that I'm dealing with. So I would say explore how to stay engaged with your loved ones, but also honor and take time for your own process. Great advice. I couldn't agree more. So, Layla, we're going to start to wrap things up. Let's talk about your hopes in the now. I love your comments about the now and for the future. Well, I'm not entirely sure what to hope for um, because I've been dealing for, you know, several months with raging graft-versus-host disease, and I'm not sure I have a lot of hope for that to go away anytime soon. But my hope is that at some point I'll no longer need immune suppression or prednisone to treat GVHD and that I won't have any flare-ups as we try to reduce the dosages on those medications. And mostly that I'll be able to recover my muscle strength, that the muscle atrophy that I've experienced will be partly or completely reversed, that I'll be able to walk a mile or so at a time that I'll be able to ride my bike, albeit on flat paved areas, that I'll be able to stand up long enough without becoming weakened that I could actually cook a meal. I want to be a better life partner. I want to be able to more spontaneously participate in activities with my wife. And um, I want to continue to explore how to live a life that's been significantly interrupted by leukemia and will never be the same again. And um, to find the joy in that, to find some meaning in that, and to accept that I don't know what's going to happen, that there's a significant amount of uncertainty, but I'm able to live the best life I can right now. Wow. This is really, really great stuff. And I just so appreciate you sharing your wisdom and your compassion and your heart on all of this. I just know that so many people are going to listen to this and feel your friendship and your strength, and it's going to help them on their journey. Thanks again for being with us today and sharing your story. Is there any last words of wisdom or comments that you'd like to end this session with? Well, I just want to thank you and the NBMT link for the chance to have this conversation 
and to share my experience and the best tips that I have today. It's an ongoing process. It's a very long process. And my heart goes out to anyone who's dealing with this journey. There are plenty of us that are with you. Keep connected to NBMT Link. Oh, thank you. And, you know, we do have coffee clutches and other programs. So I just encourage people to check out our website and see how you can connect with wonderful people like Leela at every turn. So thank you again for sharing your time with us today. Thank you. This has been the Marrow Masters Podcast. If you know someone who would benefit from the information in our show, please share this episode with them. And don't miss future episodes of our show. Follow Marrow Masters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you're listening right now. And to connect with the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, visit nbmtlink.org or follow the link in our show notes.